Not too accurate, so we'll try to we'll try to stay on the real time. Okay, so uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Red Miles, who's the Claire Booth uh, Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Georgetown University in the Department of Computer Science. And uh, if you look at the bio, uh, Alyssa's worked uh, in so many different. Uh, so many different places, including Max Planck in Germany, uh, Microsoft, Facebook, a few other places as well. So a wide range of experience. And uh, she's published in USMIX Security and uh, in Soup's conference, which long, long time ago, uh, Paul and I went to. So um, a lot of different things. Okay, and just to address the obvious thing in the <laughs> This is the first time we've met. Um, so one day I was Googling to check my publications on Google Scholar and other places. I just Googled, I always had just could Google Red Miles publications. So I Google Red Miles publications and then I see Alyssa. And then it's like, who's this? And then I see a student, a PhD student in the University of Maryland. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And, um, and I vaguely knew there's a bunch of Red Miles is in Maryland. Uh, which is more or less where I'm originally from. And then, uh, but, but I didn't know any of them. So then I think, uh, I think one time when we had a job opening, but it wasn't quite right, I emailed Alyssa and it wasn't the right timing for her. Uh, but then uh, now she's gone on and done uh, quite a few things. I think you have a similar story about... I do. I went to the, the CHI conference, and I went to pick up my badge, and they were like, oh, I thought you already checked in. And I was like, no. And then they looked at the list, and they're like, oh, there's two of you. And I was <laughs> like, oh, maybe there's two of me. But <laughs> and missed, we've never met. Yeah. That particular CHI. Yeah. Looking you up, and I was like, oh, my gosh, it's this very senior professor. And I was a PhD student, and I was going to email and yeah. be like, we have the same name. <laughs> <laughs> So it was a kind of tentative a few years before we, you know, and then of course COVID, but uh, I'm so glad the uh, informatics part of it sponsored you coming and talking today. Thank so, you all. Very good. Awesome. Well, thank you, David, for the, the kind introduction. Um, I am a computer scientist by training, although my work sits a bit at the intersection of computer science and HCI and, and social science. Um, and today I'd like to talk about uh, what we can learn about building safer systems from studying how sex workers use technology. Uh, so the UN estimates that as many as one in 200 people will work in sex work uh, or in the sex industry in their lifetime. Um, and people uh, often talk about uh, sex work sort of existing on a spectrum, um, where there's a spectrum of kind of choice and consent in how people uh, engage in sexual exchange. Uh, and in the talk today, I'm gonna to be focused specifically on consensual sex work. So not um, for sexual exchange or sex trafficking. Um, and even within sex work, uh, scholars talk about there being a continuum, uh, much like any job, uh, you can have jobs that are more a form of survival or not a very good job all the way through a uh, career or specialty labor. Um, the research I'm gonna to present today sits kind of at the bad job through career side of the spectrum, um, although I've partnered with some community groups on looking at uh, street-based sex work, that's not what we're gonna talk about today. 
regardless of sort of the level of choice or privilege in the sex work that people are doing, um, sex work is situated in a very complicated legal landscape. Uh, so in Germany, where I was faculty before, full service in-person sex work is legal. Um, whereas here in the US, except a few counties in Nevada, that's not the case. Um, although digital only sex work and other in-person sex work like stripping is legal in the US. Um, regardless of the legal status of the work that people are doing, it's still a very stigmatized form of labor. Uh, so for example, even in countries where the labor is legal and people are paying taxes, landlords may not want to house people doing this kind of labor. Uh, families may not be okay with them doing it, et cetera. Um, and technology is used in sex work in many different ways. So there's in-person sex work all the way through digital only work, uh, which would include like webcamming, which is basically virtual stripping uh, or platforms like OnlyFans that we'll talk about a bit more later where people are selling explicit content. Uh, and since 2018, I've been looking at the role of tech uh, in sex work in collaboration uh, with a number of different scholars, uh, Hannah Barricott, Catherine Barlow, Adam Dupay, Vaughn Hamilton, uh, Esther Hargitay, Michelle Masaryk, Allison McDonald, Florian Schaub, and Ananta Seneji. Um, and people often ask me how I got into this, particularly as someone coming out of security. Uh, and the brief answer to that is that when I was doing work in the security community, people would often tell me, well, if only those darn users understood the risks, they'd use the security tools, they'd use the two-factor authentication, they'd use the password managers. And I wasn't so convinced that it was necessarily a risk perception problem, but I needed to evaluate that hypothesis. And so I had been trying to think about high risk communities, communities that definitely knew their risk, but who didn't get specialized training. So unlike journalists, sex workers don't have necessarily an organization to teach them about security. And someone actually suggested this community to me and I thought, oh, this seems like a really interesting intersection and we'll talk about how some of the problems we see here intersect with other communities like activists, LGBTQ communities, and so forth. What's kept me looking at it after the initial uh, investigation is that there are a number of problems here that are sort of unsolved. Um, and there may be some ways that, that technology as well as society can help. Uh, very briefly, we've had a number of papers with some paper recognitions. I'll talk about about five of these today um, and can point to more. One of our goals with this work is to actually change some things. Um, so in addition to press and policy, we've also done a lot of work with the European Sex Worker Rights Alliance um, and with some sex working platforms, one of which uh, is highlighted here that we're currently partnered with to try to improve uh, the state of safety. Uh, one of the other goals that I'll talk about at the end is empowering the community and doing their own research. The sex working community is somewhat unusual in that they do a lot of research on themselves. Um, but it's not always recognized as legitimate because it's not conducted in the academy. So some of our goal has been uh, translating that. Okay, uh, with that context now set, um, I wanna start out by talking about challenges faced in digital mediation of in-person sex work. Uh, and then we'll talk about the growth of uh, online professional sexual content creation, which was particularly spurred uh, by COVID-19. And we'll conclude with talking about some opportunities for engineering and also policy. Okay, um, so the starting point for me was to try to understand what challenges, particularly safety challenges, in-person sex workers were facing with digital mediation. And in order to answer that question, uh, we ended up conducting a two year long mixed methods research project. Uh, and this project aimed to answer the question, how do sex workers want to use technology and what barriers do they face in doing so? And in order to answer that, we conducted 29 interviews and 65 surveys with sex workers in three countries where sex work is legal. Uh, and we recruited participants through in-person flyering in areas with brothels and massage parlors, through sex work unions, and to a small extent, less than 10% of our sample through snowball sampling. Now, this was a community that I was new to working with. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that when I was doing this research, I was doing it in a way that fit with the community. Um, and so I had hired some sex working consultants to help ensure the appropriateness of our materials beyond kind of usual IRB. Okay, so how do people want to use technology? Then we found that there were six primary technology needs. The first is advertising, right? You have to bring clients to you. Um, while some people are working in brothels or massage parlors or with um, kind of organization, 
One of the big benefits of digital sex work is that you don't have to work with a manager. You can work independently. You can have a personal website, and there are a lot of listing platforms you can list. Uh, people also want to make sure that their clients are safe to meet with. You don't know this client before they contact you, and so you don't know that they are who they say they are, so people are running background checks. And also, as there's been some work in the Kai community uh, by Angelica Strohmeyer and colleagues, they'll use uh, what we call bad client lists or other resources to check whether others in the community have had a bad experience before they meet them. People, of course, are communicating with their clients uh, and also trying to accept digital payments, although we'll talk about some issues that people had with that as well as receive gifts. People also want to use technology for support and education. And um, so it's not necessarily the case that you can just kind of get started in sex work and go to a, a training academy. You're really learning from your peers. How do I do this safely? How do I set my pricing? So on and so forth. And that is a core uh, way that people are using technology, particularly if they're not connected to an in-person community. They're also trying to do activism around sex work regulation. These are the ways people wanted to use technology. Uh, what we found was they often were unable to do so. And one of the main reasons they were unable to do so was platform censorship. Um, so platforms often censor both sexual expression and sex work, regardless of the legality of that labor for the individual in their country. Um, so to give some examples, one participant told us, I, had, I don't know how many followers on Instagram, and at some point, I hadn't even posted nudes or violated the terms of service. At some point, it was just deleted. So that definitely hurt my business, not in a way that I bled to death, but it was shit. So when else kind of summarized the situation as, as someone who offers proactive erotic services, you are clearly at a disadvantage in the American-dominated internet. There is censorship, content that must not be present, page blocks, photos that not, must not be shown, and restrictions. So most of the technology platforms people are trying to use are US-based. Uh, there's both been US policy changes as well as just kind of general American sort of attitudes towards sex and sex work that are impacting folks who are doing legal business elsewhere. This was an especially big problem with payment. Um, so people said it would be great if I could take PayPal. But sex work is forbidden there. And I've had colleagues who tried to use it and they've been banned for life. <laughs> So if your PayPal is linked to your legal photo ID, which it often has to be, even if you leave sex work, you can't use it. Um, and if you look at the terms of service, for example, for Instagram, they ban any content that facilitates, encourages, or coordinates commercial sexual services. That can include conversations about harm reduction, health techniques, et cetera, anything kind of related to sex work. So the first participant who said, I didn't post nudes, just being a sex worker could be enough for the account to come down. We also found, and prior news reports have found, technology regulating not just sex workers doing work, but also the identity of being a sex worker at all. Um, so Airbnb in particular, we had a number of people reporting being banned just for being sex workers. I have not shown my face. I don't use the same email or phone, and I don't work from Airbnb, and still I get banned. We had one participant who had a phone for work, phone for personal, and a phone just for Airbnb. Although from looking through the patents um, of a company Airbnb acquired, what it actually seems like they are doing is using a combination of network traffic analysis and facial recognition to scrape different uh, websites on the internet and match people's photo ID to figure out if they're undesirable. And in this patent, in addition to sex workers, people with uh, certain mental or even physical disabilities were also included as kind of undesirable people who might be removed from the platform. So censorship is a safety problem. Um, to give two examples, some law enforcement contacts said, you know, criminals know that sex workers can't use digital payment platforms. So they will linger in areas where workers are leaving work or often use hotels in order to rob them because they know they would be carrying large amounts of cash. Um, as I said, inability to form online community or getting deplatformed can limit people's ability to vet clients and access to information from peers. The other issue that we saw, which is certainly not uh, just an issue for this community, is outing and context collapse. So other people discovering you're a sex worker could lead to violence, it could lead to losing housing, it could also lead to leaking related identities that might not be legal in, say, a country of origin where you're going to go back to. 
And um, one participant described an experience of this where they said their romantic partner who was a photographer had photographed them a couple of times. And they weren't very smart and they published their photos with his like watermark on a relatively public forum. And it turns out that a client of theirs was more fond of them than they realized and had been looking through this public forum and found their photos and then did some research, figured out who the boyfriend was, where both of them worked, this person wasn't a full-time sex worker, what they did, so on and so forth. And so now they're very careful about that. Laws regulating business can also cause uh, certain issues. So in Germany, there's an Impressum law. So every website needs to have a legal name and mailing address. Uh, if you're running a personal website as a sex worker, you don't really want to necessarily give that to your clients. Um, so some sex work unions uh, came together and rented a physical space with a mailing address and one member who is willing to be out use their name and everyone in that union use that address and that person's name on their personal website. So people come up with a lot of different digital strategies to stay safe, and some of our goal is to understand what those strategies were. So to avoid uh, during service violence, people did vetting, as I mentioned before, as well as covering, which is also a behavior in the online dating literature. So what they'll do is they will tell a friend or a colleague, this is where I'm going, this is who I'm seeing, this is when I should be done. If I haven't checked back with you by a certain time, this is what you should do. Um, Apple iMessage just recently offered this. I was texting my mother and saying where I was going and it popped up and said, do you want to have her check in with you in two hours when you're back? So they recently added some support for this. In terms of digital, um, people were doing a lot of I manual identity management, right? So using aliases, also using a lot of separate accounts and frequently separate devices. Over half of our participants were using separate devices. Uh, and this wasn't without cost. As one person said, it's time consuming, it's annoying, and it's stressful having all these phones and personas and things I have to remember. And I'm like, shit, did I miss that when I put this up all the time? Uh, similarly, self-censorship, right? So this person said, I'm legally allowed to work, but I'm afraid of getting banned from certain countries just for being a sex worker. So I remove all my information, my accounts, my websites, and I wipe my phone before traveling. Uh, the U.S., for example, if they think you're coming here to do sexual services, will ban you from entering for less. What are they not using? Well, if you remember, I came here to investigate if they use those security tools. They do not. Um, and there were two reasons for that. One, most of them don't address the two threat models we have. Yes, encryption helps with platform censorship, but not from PayPal. That's not an option. Um, and two, there's a power dynamic here. As one participant said, I would gladly do all of the above, but that really only works when the customers participate. And as a sex worker, uh, I can no more sort of ask my client to pay me in cryptocurrency than I can ask Georgetown to pay me in cryptocurrency. So if you're a very highly privileged worker, you might be able to do that, but for most other people, they have to comply with what the client wants to do. Um, and we heard often about workers sometimes teaching clients, but often there was a power and also kind of age and technical literacy that you uh, the other thing people are not using is security and privacy settings, largely because they're not trustworthy or people had tried using them and they didn't work. So they still got clients suggested as friends. Uh, and as one person succinctly summarized, I don't think it matters if you put those settings on or off. So there's no verifiability of those working. So the necessity of relying on manual strategies means there's a lot of resignation and regret. Um, one person said, you know, if I log into the brothel platform, in the browser on my personal phone, and my Apple account for my work phone is registered to my passport name, they're able to link my identity. And this stuff could get me killed or deported. This person was talking about going back home to their home country and said, I'm not prepared. Okay, so in summary, people want to use technology in a number of different ways. They're facing challenges with platform censorship as well as outing and context collapse. And they're trying to use techniques for identity management, they're self-censoring, and they're not using security tools. At the end of the talk, we'll talk about what are some techniques from security and engineering that could fill this gap. Um, but before we get there, things changed with COVID-19. So all of this work was conducted right before the pandemic, and then the pandemic happened. And existing in-person sex workers were no longer doing in-person work, both because they didn't want to get COVID and their clients didn't want to get COVID, and because previously legal work became illegal. 
So in the US, doing stripping was uh, not allowed at certain points in time in Europe, certain in-person full service work was not allowed under lockdown laws and regulation. And so if people wanted to keep earning an income, they had to move online. And a lot of people were moving to a platform called OnlyFans. Um, it was started in 2016, and it uses a digital patronage model, much like Patreon, uh, where subscribers can buy a subscription to a feed to see content. They can message creators, pay them for messaging. They can request custom content, pay tips, pay-per-view, et cetera. And while the platform was started in 2016, you can see a very rapid uptick in user base over the pandemic. Um, and this was not just as a result of sort of in-person workers going online, but there were a lot of newcomers, people who are brand new to the sex industry who are starting to join OnlyFans. And so we did another uh, to your this time just qualitative project, trying to understand why were newcomers coming online to this professional sexual content creation in much larger numbers than we'd seen in previous platforms. And for both existing workers and new workers, what risks were persisting from the in-person space and what new risks emerge? So there's often a policy debate, is digital only sex work safer? Is digital mediation of sex work safer, et cetera? What can we find? And finally, again, our strategies question, maybe now people are using those tools, let's find out. So this time um, we did 58 interviews, 19 were with people new to the sex industry. All of those interviews were in the United States. Uh, and then the rest of the interviews were with in-person workers who pivoted online. Uh, and those were conducted in the countries listed above. We sampled at the onset of COVID-19 and also about a year and a half into the pandemic. And again, used a similar kind of methodology. At this point, we were more uh, embedded with some of the, the sex working community. And so there was also kind of in-community recruitment for the people who were in-person sex workers. So starting with just the newcomers, why were they willing to use this platform? We find that there were five motivations that people had for coming to use OnlyFans. The first was the platform achieved a level of mainstream visibility and acceptance that as far as we can tell has not been achieved before. And this was as a result of a combination of celebrity hype, platform design, and peer suggestion. So Cardi B joined OnlyFans in August of 2020, uh, and she claims this was as a result of Beyonce mentioning the site in a remix in April. And that mention caused a 15% spike in traffic in the subsequent 24 hours. And if we went back to that user graph, you can actually kind of see the Cardi B moment uh, and then the, the uptick. Um, and so some of our participants said, yeah, I heard about that and I thought it was cool. I like the idea of these mostly women reforming sexuality in their own way and being able to claim or reclaim something. Um, people started hearing about it all the time. So at first I was hearing it was lucrative and then I was hearing about it everywhere. And I was curious, I wanted to see what the hype was about. Uh, OnlyFans also did this with some intentionality. So the platform has very little discovery if you go and make an OnlyFans account, you aren't gonna just get a feed. You have to pay and subscribe and you have to know those usernames to find them. And it's very different than some other platforms. And so in order to drive traffic to their pages, people have to do cross-platform promotion on mainstream platforms like Instagram and TikTok and what was then Twitter. Uh, and so as one of our participants said, on every big tweet that blows up, there's usually someone's OnlyFans invite. And this combination of platform design and celebrity hype meant that there was a lot of peer suggestion uh, where peers were saying, hey, why don't you get on OnlyFans? Or I got on OnlyFans. Did you see so-and-so got on OnlyFans? This particular person said, yeah, my sister, she said to me, you have a great body. Why don't you just try OnlyFans? And I was going to do it for maybe just a couple of weeks to take care of things financially, but it lasted longer. The second reason that people are joining OnlyFans was that they perceived it as being a better form of labor. So they perceived it as having higher, safer, and easier earnings than other forms of non-sexual gig work and service work. Uh, digging into that a little bit more deeply, similar to other gig work, OnlyFans offers flexible hours, work from home, uh, and some of our participants highlighted accessibility 
So this was someone who had an intermittent uh, chronic health condition, and they said, I can still do OnlyFans even if my legs aren't working because I can just kind of sit. And this was someone who was doing Uber and Lyft before. Uh, they also perceived it as better than other gig work in certain ways. So they perceive themselves as having more control. Uh, it allowed for me to establish my boundaries better. Unlike customer service jobs I've worked in before, where I can't talk back, I can't cut out the customer because it's up to the manager. On OnlyFans, I have the control to just block someone. Uh, they also perceived it as being more profitable. I make more money and I can control the price more. I will note that this was a very common perception among participants, the newcomers. Um, often they realized through the process of doing OnlyFans that it was a lot more work than they expected, although the majority did continue with it, but it wasn't quite as profitable as they thought. Uh, and finally, it was safer. So this person said, I definitely make more money than on Uber and Lyft, and I feel safer because I'm not actually meeting with people. Before, there were strangers getting into my car. Some other people who had done uh, kind of like waitressing work also said, you know, I have to like... Um, schmooze with my customers in order to get good tips. In this case, I have a lot more distance from them. They can't touch me, um, this kind of barriers. Other motivations were, of course, pandemic factors. People had time. They didn't want to do in-person work because of COVID, or they had lost their jobs. Um, they also saw the potential to repurpose their existing content or skills or audiences. Uh, one participant said, man, I've been giving my nudes away for free, and now I can sell them. Um, people also, we had cosplayers who had big kind of online followings that they hadn't monetized, and they saw OnlyFans as a way to make more money than through, say, uh, like creator uh, fund type of options. And finally, the platform offered an opportunity and a space for sexual expression. As we talked about, sexual expression is often censored from mainstream platforms, and so for some participants, OnlyFans was kind of a sexy social media a place to form community, connect with other creators. Um, and while this was a minority in our sample, for a couple of participants who are from the gay men's community, they actually said to us, you know, I didn't start in OnlyFans to make money. I started it to be able to share nudes during the pandemic. And I just set my paywall at like $2 and I just send my account to my friends. I don't promote it. I've made like $200 total. It's just the best way to be able to share this kind of content. And it has like a Twitter-like interface. So there were other ways that people were repurposing the platform. Okay, so back to safety. Um, while the platform offered many benefits, that doesn't mean there weren't risks. Um, so digital-only work requires a bigger digital footprint, and this is what we heard especially from the, the in-person workers. So you're having to promote on more platforms, and that means you're subject to potentially more censorship. When people are doing in-person work, they might have an Instagram account or like one social media, but mostly they are advertising on like brothel listing platforms. Now you're really having to push out your content to a lot of places to drive traffic. Um, and this censorship was not being felt equally, and this is certainly not the first work to report this, right? Uh, as one person said, it's frustrating to be living constantly censored, both on Twitter and Instagram, it's a systematic way of silencing people of color and queer folks, so we just give up and stop posting, which essentially is what happens. It's effective because it's exactly what happened I gave. Um, in addition to sort of mainstream platform censorship, OnlyFans itself had quite a bit of precarity. Uh, so in summer of 2021, there was a lot of pressure um, from uh, anti-LGBTQ, anti-other things, um, group on banks uh, to put pressure on um, the both Pornhub and also OnlyFans to do better with child exploitation uh, imagery. Um, and as a result of the pressure from this group, the banks actually pulled their willingness to do payment processing for those platforms, which led OnlyFans to immediately ban adult content from the platform. Um, they won't release what percentage of their creators are adult creators, but it's estimated to be like 95%. So all of a sudden people were no longer able to do their jobs and in some cases lost access to the platform. And this was very, very scary. They did reverse the ban, um, but this led to a lot of sense of precarity. And as one person expressed, when you de-platform creators, you take away their community and that's violence. You're isolating people. And we all know from this last year that isolation leads to severe mental health consequences. So yes, you're taking away a job, but also a community inconvenience. Um, 
the people were also having to share more information. So a sociologist who studies sex work, Angela Jones, um, writes in the book Camming that uh, clients are often looking for embodied authenticity when it comes to digital work. They want to feel like they have a real relationship with the worker. Um, and as a result, workers need to create a very rich online persona for their sex working persona, which means they have to share more about themselves than an in-person work where that authenticity can be made in person. And this can lead to, to some scary interactions um, with this sharing. So one particular participant said, I took a selfie in the bathroom and I uploaded it to Twitter. A guy went to the same bathroom and posted a selfie of him in that bathroom under mine. Like, I know where you are. Those stalker things are the ones that make me more scared. Uh, and they said that this happened about 30 minutes after they had left that bathroom that was in a public space. Finally, um, you're having to share more explicit content. So a lot of the in-person workers said, you know, when I did advertising for in-person work, I was using clothed shots or shots with no head Given the market saturation and what people are purchasing here, I'm having to sell really explicit content. And that content gets stolen uh, and reshared elsewhere. Um, and this is a form of what's called image-based sexual abuse. It happens both to sex workers and to folks who are recreationally sharing intimate content, where basically I you know, made custom content for a client, and then they took it and shared it and either resold it or repackaged it or sent it to other people, and that was not within uh, the consent arrangement. So as one in-person worker summarized, the worst is that you have to have in mind that those videos will be leaked and all of the people around you are going to get them at some point and they will be forever on the internet. In face-to-face -face work, I didn't have my intimacy compromised. If I had troubles, they were going to stay there. With online work, people will have photos and videos of everything and I won't ever be able to delete that. They will stay floating around forever. Also, if I stop sex work, that may affect me in the future too. So most of the in-person workers we talked to did intend to keep doing digital work in part because it offered uh, certain forms of safety in terms of more distance from clients. But one part of their threat consideration was, well, I already had to do this online work. The stuff is already out there and it's already out there forever. So now that I've kind of made that shift, even though I wasn't happy with those risks, I stopped. Okay, so what strategies are people using to stay safe since we have a bit of a different um, uh, threatscape here? We see a lot more censorship evasion strategies than we saw before. Um, in the in-person sex work, people mostly like were complaining about censorship, but just kind of letting it happen. Um, here we have a lot more evasion. Um, so people were using tools to try to figure out what would and wouldn't be censored. Uh, one participant described a page that claimed to use the same machine learning as Instagram in order to tell you if this content was too sexy and whether you could upload it to Instagram. I doubt that it does use the same machine learning, but that's how it was pitched. Um, people are also diversifying platforms, so they're username squatting, they're preparing for the future, especially after that OnlyFans ban, they're compiling lists of their clients. Um, because in a way, the platform really has a lot of control with having your client list. And if it goes down, all of a sudden, you have no idea who your subscribers were. So people are starting to diversify across other platforms and kind of try to keep track of their clients. And they were still self-censoring or trying to get around platform censorship. So TikTok started censoring OnlyFans links. So people put it behind the link tree. Then TikTok crawled the link tree and they put it behind another link tree and, you know, the usual. Um, and also, uh, people were very careful with terms of service. So usually, when we study security and privacy, no one ever reads the terms of service, and for very good reason. Our participants here are the exception. Over half of them had read the entirety of OnlyFans terms of service, if not other platforms. Uh, and some of them had made cheat sheets to know what they could and couldn't post. Um, so they are really actively trying not to get deplatformed and to comply with the rules. They just don't know what they are. People are also trying to protect their content. Um, so we saw some interesting techniques uh, where people would put almost like doxing level information in a watermark of a piece of content. So like the client's name, if they had their address, they would say the client's name a lot in a video in order to reduce the likelihood that they would reshare. Um, people would also try to do content tracking. Uh, so the main way you get your content down, recreational sex worker, American, not American, 
is using the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which says if you took this piece of content, you are allowed to take it down. Uh, and so one person said, well, there's some competitor to OnlyFans and they will automatically send these takedown notices. So they'll crawl the internet and presumably use facial rec uh, or some other image matching to try to find your content that's been re-uploaded and then send these takedown notices. Uh, and so they were considering switching to that platform uh, just because they'd be responsible for takedown. Uh, people also used Google alerts for their stage name, all sorts of different techniques to try to see what was out there. Finally, um, for outing, people are still doing identity management, right? Um, so one cosplayer said, so easy to get people are creepy and they're trying to find my Facebook account. They're finding out where I worked, where I lived. So going by a different name adds a layer of security. Um, they're hiding identifying features. This particular person did some photos only with the top half and some photos only with the bottom half of their face. But of course, a client stitched those together and said, look, I know what your face looks like. Uh, a lot of folks would hide tattoos, shampoo bottles in the background, all daylight, weird room shapes, anything to try to avoid um, identification. It was very hard to sell content with no face. So while people would like to do that, it was hard to make a living. Uh, and finally, this person described a mistake where they said, while I was on holiday, I posted a picture of myself on the beach on my main Instagram with my friends and family and it, on my point Instagram and I tagged my location and some client clicked on that location tag, scrolled through all the pictures from that beach and found the main account. Okay, so we talked about a lot of problems. Uh, what can we build? Um, and then we'll talk about why building won't solve the whole problem. Um, so what do we need? Well, tools that provide algorithmic transparency. We've all been saying this, we still need them. Uh, we also need tools that accommodate multiple personas. Uh, this was especially prevalent for this community, but also for other communities, and tools for tracking and protection of content. Doing digital rights management in a decentralized way when you're a small creator, very different than being Warner Brothers and trying to get your content down. And these tools help people other than sex workers, right? So algorithmic transparency helps racial and gender minorities, helps activists. Multiple personas also helps journalists, activists, LGBTQ users. If I'm not out in one context, then I might want to be two different people. I don't need ads leaking that information. And tools for tracking and protection of content help recreational sharers of this content and uh, image-based abuse. Tools. So how do we build it? Um, I'm not going to go through all of these technical directions today, but I'll highlight a couple of them. Um, so in platform censorship, we can think about filter analysis, right? So there's some existing work on model extraction um, to try to infer what these platforms are doing, but few of them are built for an individual or an outsider to be able to check, will this content be censored or not? Um, and part of the problem there is there's often kind of rate limiting probes. If you wanted to take content and keep posting it, platforms aren't necessarily going to let you do that to evaluate. Um, and it's also not just algorithms that are censoring, it's human reporting. Um, so you could think about what kind of crowdsourcing experiments might be possible here to sort of reverse engineer or audit what kinds of uh, filters are being used. Mm -hmm. uh, second thing is robust content matching. So in the child exploitation imagery space, we've been using for a long time a like 1990s algorithm uh, called perceptual hashing, where you can take an image, you look at all of that pixel data, and you compute a hash. Uh, and then companies can try to hash match whether something being uploaded is the same as a known piece of exploitation material. This is lovely, but it is not very robust to modifications of that image. So if you rotate it slightly, put a thumb on it, et cetera, not terribly robust. Um, these algorithms are also not designed to be run by individuals, um, nor are they a proactive search. So they're not scanning and finding the content that you have on the internet. It's just cooperative platforms will check these databases. And there is one for adults. Um, people are also very concerned about the privacy of these hashes. And there's some emerging work that generative AI algorithms are actually able to reverse the images to some level um, of uh, resolution. We don't know how well yet. And so there's some concern if I let you hash a bunch of my images and I'm basically giving you a data set of my images, if I leak that data set, I'm even worse off than I was before. Um, so there's some open questions if you wanted to do scanning around, you know, how much of the internet do you need to scan to have sufficient coverage to get most of the, the images? 
what happens with image obfuscation, and of course, how do you prevent it from being abused? Because you're basically building kind of PIMIs 2.0. Uh, finally, um, we talked a lot about kind of outing and context box, and particularly this kind of multi-persona situation. And this multi-persona situation also extends to like multiple users of a given device. So in the global majority, we see a lot of people device sharing. Um, and there's some existing technical work trying to separate activity on mobile and desktop computing devices or work and personal profiles. But most of these proposals assume it's a single user on the device in different roles, not two users that want to be viewed completely different. Um, so there's some confidential computing architecture that kind of heads in this direction, but it hasn't really been combined with any sort of network fingerprinting analysis to like evaluate, can we actually have a single device with two separate people who don't get inferred as the same person? Um, so a lot of potentially interesting uh, secure information flow and architecture. Uh, if you're interested in building stuff, we have a, a paper coming out uh, this month in IEEE Security and Privacy Magazine that goes through these directions and the existing literature in the space and sort of where are there are some gaps. In yeah. I just need one data point. So yeah. I've talked to you all, talking to people a lot, and, and they say that a burner phone and be it's dead after spending 30 seconds in a moving car with a zone set. Yeah. So is it doable? Basically, if you're in the same location with someone, um, even if GPS location, location is off on the phone, just being in a cell, move, you know, moving is good and good. You won't be able to separate those components. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, to be clear, I think most of the technical directions we point out here are like 20 year agenda if they're even doable. Um, and, you know, even I think Faraday cages wouldn't quite do the trick. So I don't know that it's a solvable problem. I just wish that it was. Yeah, so I agree with you. Yeah. Um, and before we build, or in addition to building, uh, there are other things we need to do, right? And one of them is that part of how a lot of this is possible is that we're allowing sort of American tech platforms to enforce either American policy or their own view of that policy um, on people all over the world in terms of what work and identities are allowed. Um, and this has, of course, affected not just sex workers, but also trans folks, drag queens, indigenous communities, so forth. Um, and as one participant said, I want technology that considers me a person and not a product but that's really asking a lot from the anonymous virtual world. Uh, we also, of course, need to listen to these voices when we develop that policy, and in particular, empower communities to design, build, and evaluate the technology that serves them. Uh, so even when thinking about the maybe more or less doable uh, technical directions, there's something that we should build in collaboration with the communities, not just sort of like, oh, yay, off security goes again to build some stuff that we think is going to solve people's problems. Uh, and one participant summarized this as my, one of my biggest pet peeves is that almost all the platforms sex workers use for advertising and for keeping ourselves safe, none of them are run by sex workers. Most of them are run by older white dudes who are profiting off the workers, and I find that problematic in many ways. Uh, this is, of course, easier said than done. Um, one approach that we have been using is through the, the PRISM Center, uh, which is an NSF funded project, we've been having community resident researchers. Um, so re resident researchers who are embedded in our group leading their own research projects um, and being supported in pursuing further education or research fellowships if that's what they would want to do. Um, that's one possible approach. There are a lot of different approaches uh, that folks have taken. Um, and with that, if you're interested in sort of intimacy research, most of our research now is focused on image-based sexual abuse, so both non-consensual distribution of images and how uh, tech can create friction in that, as well as uh, generative AI and non-consensual creation of intimate images. So you can learn more about that here, and otherwise happy to take questions. We have a good 10 minutes for questions, so go for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I was curious if you could speak a little about um, 
I guess this is a lot about um, sex platforms online. What about platforms that um, sex work happens on but aren't explicitly sex <clears throat> platforms? Um, kind of broadening that definition out of how these problems are regulatory versus yeah, um, so I think there's a couple of things. So we've also looked at um, kind of the, the generalization of this problem, which is like, how do you look at platforms that mediate offline interactions, right? So I think with one of you, I had a conversation about like Facebook Marketplace or online dating or other forms of gig work where you're maybe being algorithmically matched or you're finding this person and you're trying to use online information to make a decision about whether someone is safe offline. And in some ways, this looks a little bit like a spam detection problem where you're like, OK, is this link safe to click? Uh, but it's a bit harder in that you're trying to discern uh, perhaps a much less uh, clearly defined set of heuristics that would signal like good or bad. Um, and one of the things we see in these um, algorithmically mediated offline interactions is that people don't have anywhere particularly good to turn to to report harm. So they tend not to report harm to the platform because they're not sure what they would do with that information. They have no transparency. And so they end up reporting to whisper networks like friends or online groups or, or lists. Um, and that information helps the people who are connected there, but it doesn't like circle back to the platform in any way. And so I think one of the things that comes up on like dating apps and, and non-sex work platforms, but sex work platforms too, is how do you get offenders off the platform when they can just recreate accounts? And how do you, in a safe and respectful way, kind of capture these experiences of harm when people don't trust the platform or law enforcement? Um, so that's one that I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, hi, uh, thank you for the great talk, very insightful. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about intersecting identities of the participants and like when like, for instance, LGBTQ sex workers or other identities, how does that impact? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So I'd say the, the first way it impacts is um, the degree of risk that people are facing. Um, so certainly for folks who are part of the LGBTQ community or particularly workers of color, and um, we're often, at least in Europe, coming from countries where um, they would be subject to family violence or deportation or not being able to go home. Um, so we saw a lot more um, kind of inability to be out. And actually, a few workers of color talked about sort of having the privilege to be out and feeling like an obligation to be out to represent the existence of their community because they were never going to go home, for example. Um, and so that is one of the ways that we see it. Uh, the other is the platform censorship. And there's some very nice research um, from Gabriela Garcia, who's at the New School, about the way that different bodies are censored, particularly um, when people post like sexual content on mainstream platforms. So this gets a bit to the, the question before, um, where bigger bodies, bodies of color, disabled bodies, queer bodies, receive more censorship. And we see this even with um, kind of non-sexual um, influencers. You'll see much more uh, flexibility for what gets uh, taken down and not taken down for people who fit kind of the traditional stereotype um, than for other kinds of things. Oh, <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, Thank you. Lucas Silva, wonderful presentation and work. I'm curious about um, your experience building the connection with the participants. Like, since the, the you know, the context is so, uh, so much about vulnerability, risks, and trust. Um, I'm curious about how you manage to overcome that gap and, you know, as someone from an institution as well as uh, all that. So I'm really curious about that. Yeah, great question. Um, so, yeah, this is a very overstudied population and a population that was often studied from kind of a risky behavior, problematizing type um, <laughs> lens. And so when I started, I did not necessarily have connection to this community. So one of the first things I did um, was actually like reading public forums, um, both in German and in English, just to understand like the language with which people talked about their experiences in community. Um, and then through various like connections in my network. So I will say that security community is often very connected to like activists and dissidents. I was able to get to um, some folks who are in the sex working community who are willing to talk to me and, and talk about um, the work. And I was also actually in Germany at the time. And I 
previous to even studying this, would talk to, uh, there was a window brothel in my town and I would talk to the folks who worked there when I went home from work. And one day I was just like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this thing. Like, is this a terrible idea? Would you ever participate? And we had like a conversation and they actually helped me look at the materials a few times and um, they paid them for their time and so forth. So sort of, um, uh, I don't know, accidental maybe I should say. Um, and then what helped with a lot of the recruitment originally was that um, I emailed a number of sex work unions and organizations when I was recruiting. And one of the uh, leaders of one of those organizations came to the interview and it turns out she was actually vetting whether the interview was like coming from a good place and the quality of the questions. And at the end, she was like, you know, this was a really good study. I'm sending it out on the mailing list. And I was like, okay, great. Woke up the next morning and a hundred people had signed up for an interview. And I was like, oh dear, I cannot interview a hundred people. And that is in part how it became a mixed method study because I made a waiting list and I said, thank you so much. I really want to talk to you. Let me get back to you. And then we did uh, kind of a follow-up survey. So what I'd say is once trust was built with the community, people actually want data and they want kind of academically stamped information to be able to go to policymakers and to tech platforms and say, hey, we have a problem, blah, blah, blah. It just has to kind of come from the right place. And so we try to do a few things in our work, um, which is aside from Kalfmisch that was mentioned in here, that's like a very widespread German brothel platform. We do not mention the name of any mainstream platforms that people use um, because we don't want like media to pick it up and be like, oh, this platform, blah, blah, blah. And then there's more censorship. Um, and we also try to take care in kind of balancing how we describe techniques that people use without being so specific that clients would be able to kind of figure out um, reverse engineering. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for Yeah, sure. I did write a book chapter um, for like Esther Hargitay does these like research methods books about like the experience of doing the first set. Yeah. I don't know which of oh, you sure. can. <laughs> yeah, basically. So you come from a traditional um, security and privacy background, yeah. and I suspect you would not categorize the work you do now as traditional. I'm, I, many people in this room come from computer science backgrounds and are working right now in non-traditional settings um, and with non-traditional methods. And so I'm wondering if you can talk to us about your strategies for contributing back to those communities you came from and finding a space for yourself. Yeah, um, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> so um, when I first started this work in 2018, it was very much a side project to my main research. And actually, at that time, I had a, a mentor at Max Planck, and that's who funded the work, um, in part because I was like, I have no idea how to fund this in the US. <laughs> Um, and so I did it kind of on the side. Uh, and when I went on the job market originally in 2019, I did not talk about it in my job talk. It was very, you know, spam measurement study. It's very traditional. It was one sentence in my research statement because I've had a conversation with some mentors that was like, well, if we're going to keep doing this, they better know what they're getting. Um, and so it took, it took a while. Um, we didn't publish the work for a number of years. Um, and when I first started talking about it, people either were like, you just said the word sex at a security conference and I'm running away from you. <laughs> or they were like, you must be working on sex trafficking because that's kind of what, what was done in security was looking at networks of trafficking. And I was like, well, there's sex trafficking and there's sex work, it's different. I think the key was kind of framing it in a way that made sense to the community. So that first project, we published one thing at CHI about this kind of American dominated internet issue. And then we published at Usenic Security about the threat models and the gaps in the security tools. So there's a lot more detail in that paper about like why were VPNs not solving things? Why was encryption not solving things? And that was actually very well received. I was very nervous. And to be honest, I was sort of not sure at that time if I was gonna stay in academia because I had sort of gotten the sense like, oh, your traditional security work, yay. This other stuff we can put in a corner somewhere. Um, and so I, I got a number of different pieces of feedback where people were more receptive. And actually, Alison McDonald, who is the first author on that paper, talked about it in her job talk a couple of years later. So it's amazing to see like how the world changes. Um, and I think a, a student in the student meeting asked, like, how do I decide when to send to a security conference and when to HCI? Um, and I always think about, like, who do I want to intervene with? Like, is it that I want security people to bring the tools they have to solve these problems, right? Like, can we do something? 
about the fact that you can't have the phones together for 30 seconds. Like, well, if there's any set of people who can, presumably it's the security community mm -hmm. because we've worked on Tor and we've worked on censorship and we've worked on these things. Maybe we can fix it. If I come to them and I say, ah, people are doing this policy and there's American values and whatever, they're going to be like, cool, I like that. What do I build to solve that problem? And so I think I try to think about like, who am I intervening with and why? And sometimes they're like, yeah, you think you have a nice problem and I don't agree with you and that's okay. Um, so that's, yeah, that's mostly it. So go to Germany to get money. <laughs> it's really important, interesting work until you've made it. <laughs> yes. And find the community where you can make your strategic intervention. Exactly. And once so, people kind of buy it, then uh, then, then they care more. And now, and now there's lots of lots of different work going on in security with all different communities. So I think it took a couple. It wasn't just me. A couple different people kind of saying, "Hey, when we say people in usability, they're actually different kinds of people." Let's like dig into that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you for your yeah. yeah. I was wondering. I mean, first of all, thanks for you know shedding light on the domain and, and also contributing to the safety there. I was wondering, you looked at different European countries, essentially, and I guess yeah. legal is not legal in the same way. Yeah. Do you actually have any suggestions, let's say, for on the EU level, what kind of a best of, what, what, what could work best if you yeah. utilize it for the safety of the people? Do you have any That's a good question. results in that result? Um, so we're currently doing a project in Belgium um, with with Red Lights, which is the biggest brothel platform there. And Belgium recently like fully decriminalized. Yes, I often say legal and different pieces are decriminalized. They like fully, fully decriminalized sex work. And one of the things that we're interested in is capturing like what safety concerns people have there and comparing them to our past data. We're doing surveys this time with like 750 people through the platform, uh, which is the first time where we're able to get like decent sized quant data. I would be hesitant to maybe make suggestions yet because we've had a lot of smaller samples, but I'm hoping after um, this kind of examination of Belgium with the recent shift, we'll have more data to suggest. But I think it's a very good question. Okay, I think we should end it there and like to speak in one more time. And as you notice, as, as is usual, there's uh, refreshments outside. And so uh, Alyssa will be out there to answer more questions. Very good. Thank you.